Yes, now you can. Yeah. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to Kirkville United Methodist Church for our weekly Bible study for this 21st, I believe, of December. And we are studying the book of Acts, and we're looking at chapter 14 and 15 today. If you uh, could hear us in our pre uh, conversations. We were talking about Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, and Sharon's going to write an article have it published next year <laughs> because she thinks that we ought to impeach uh, Santa because he allowed the other reindeer who were mean to abuse Rudolph just because he had a red nose. Right. They wouldn't let him play in any reindeer da- games. So, you know, we understand that prejudice has always been around and bigotry. And so uh, be kind to any red-nosed reindeer. I haven't heard of any that have been hit by a car. So um, be nice to them. Maybe a red nose means they're more intelligent. That's right. Okay. Or else they've stopped by the bar and had too much to drink. And they're alcoholics. Oh, this is frivolous, we know. But welcome to our study. Again, we're looking at Acts 14 and 15, and you are welcome to text in your questions and observations, and you may do so on my phone, uh, and that's 315-345-6534. And we were guided to talk about uh, Rudolph um, and uh, the fact that we're, we might have, my nose doesn't stop running, have a uh, um, red-nosed pastor. So, um, very good. How about if we have a word of prayer together? Lord, as we gather today on this Wednesday, uh, we have one of our members that will be missing. And always will be missing, at least physically present with us. We think of Paul LaPointe and his family, and we are sorrowed by his loss to us as he died in his apartment Um, and on the 15th. Lord, we just ask that you might comfort the family during his loss. We thank you for his partnership with us as being a member of our family, and we just ask that you might also well up within us a sense of joy from our knowledge that because you were born, O Lord, we have then forgiveness and the hope of eternal life that we know that Paul shares. We ask that you might open up our minds and our hearts and our ears to your word, that we might be both instructed and inspired, that we might follow you more dearly. Help us as we celebrate Christmas, that great time. It doesn't matter when it really happened, just that it did happen. For you so loved the world, O Father, that you gave your only Son, that whosoever believeth on you, should never perish. So, Lord, we believe. Now inspire us further that we might be devoted to serving you in the name of Jesus, in whose name we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We want to remind you that here live, we will be having our Christmas Eve candlelight communion service at 7 o'clock on Saturday night. And we are not going to be having our regular service on Sunday morning. And instead, uh, I will be having a broadcast of a special family service that my family will be broadcasting from my home on Christmas Day. I will then send out the links for that so that you can watch it at any time that you want. It's going to be a little bit special in that we have uh, Ruthie and Lydia will be singing away in the manger and doing motions to it. 
Um, Kathy and Bethany will sing a special solo of Barry Did You Know uh, that was requested. And we uh, also, Daniel will be accompanying us on guitar. He's a good, a great guitarist, actually, besides being a professor of philosophy. Um, and so we hope that you'll join us sometime during that day. And, uh, but we want to have the time free so that people could be able to enjoy their families. So enjoy your families, be safe, um, and you're welcome to join us. We'll be broadcasting also our Christmas Eve candlelight communion service as well. So if you can't join us in person, yeah, we don't know what the weather is going to be like as a storm is coming in. So um, those that plan to uh, end Christmas Eve, we're going to have a little bit different service than we've had before. Uh, we'll be starting out with singing O Holy Night. Uh, we'll have a progressive lighting of the Advent wreath to the reading of the Nativity story by several families from the church. And uh, we also will be concluding the service with um, the singing and uh, playing instrumentally with uh, Hannah um, Cornell, myself, and Sylvia Walker will be doing an organ and a trumpet. We'll be playing the Hallelujah Chorus, by, uh, um, which is very famous and a little bit different. So I hope that you'll stop and take time either to visit with us personally or join us online and uh, because we love having you. So without any further ado, I would ask that you would also open up your Bibles. Uh, I did send out uh, questions for this week on chapters 14 and 15. So, and if I stop and blow my nose, uh, you can just claim that you have a snotty pastor. And uh, that's okay, I'll take that. But we're going to read in, in chapter 14. In Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual to the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there, speaking boldly for the Lord, who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to do miraculous signs and wonders. The people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews, others with the apostles. There was, not, there was a plot afoot among the Gentiles and Jews. However, together with their leaders, to mistreat uh, the disciples and stone them. But they found out about it and fled to the Laconian cities of Lystra and Derbe and to the surrounding country, where they continued to preach the good news. <coughs> in Lystra there sat a man crippled in his feet, who was lame from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed, and called out, Stand up on your feet! At that the man jumped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in Lyconian language, The gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to the disciples. But when the apostle Barnabas and Paul heard this, they tore their clothes, rushed out into the crowd, shouting, Men, why are you doing this? We too are only men, human like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made heaven and earth and sea and everything in them. In the past he let the all nations go their own way, yet he has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their season. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city. The next day, 
he and Barnabas left for Derb. Quite an occasion. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Definitely so. Uh, We know as we read in chapter 13, there was another occasion in which um, they preached and taught at Pisidian Antioch and in Cyprus, and they were given quite a good response. They didn't get the abuse like they were that we find here in Iconium. So, as we look at this, there's some questions I want to ask. Uh, Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went, as usual, into the Jewish synagogue. So it was important to remember that where they started first was where there was a church already established. And within those synagogues or churches, as I would call them, a gathering of those who believe, um, re- realized that um, they went to where there would, they could most likely find some support. They'd also find rejection. But they went to God's people first. As I think about that, if Jesus was to come in this century, at this time, where would he first go? Come to Kirkville. Come to Kirkville? <laughs> yeah, we got Harlem. <laughs> well, there's some good churches there. I almost I had a couple of teenagers almost pulled off their bikes by some some uh, church goers at a black uh, church who were wanted to hug them to pieces. Um, and it was really neat, but, you know... Um, <coughs> And where we also start with spreading the gospel today, we spread the gospel and churches, and from there extend out into the community. God had revealed the truth uh, and called to faith uh, through the covenant he made with the Jewish people. So he was going to start there. And from there, he was going to extend out into the Gentile community. So there were Gentiles who had embraced Jesus, and uh, there are Gentiles who had embraced the Jewish faith. Okay? So they were part of the synagogues. But even though they embraced the Jewish faith, the Gentile converts were never really fully accepted. Okay? I mean, you don't have the pure blood. Yeah, we'll accept you, but uh, after you do this and do this and do this and do this, but you, you're still not one of us. Okay? Um, like you're never a native unless you were born there. That's but right. How long you've lived there, you never That's you, right. You never so what happens if you move to a to a town, yeah, right. it might be 30 years until the last vestige of the people that lived there while you moved there yeah. died away, so then all of a sudden you become an old timer, right. Right? right? All right. Some things never change in our cultures, but I want you to see that they all started with a synagogue or people who are more prone to believe. Now that means there are people in, in synagogues or churches who may be, believe things about God, but may not have truly received um, God. You know, something to believe in God, it's another thing to be able to live with God. Okay? And the words they have not had the Holy Spirit on them. Yeah. That's correct. That's correct. And that's important. That's what the book of Acts brings out, is that one of the differences is that when we come to faith, before this time, you didn't, were not necessarily receiving of the Holy Spirit, which is God's presence. But something transformative happens when you come to true and complete faith in which you have then the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, abiding within you. Um, and so, uh, that's we wanted to recognize that. They spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. So there are great numbers that believed, but even though there are great numbers believed, there are still a number who did not believe. And uh, so, but the Jews who refused to believe, so you got remember who they were, those who refused to believe, okay, stirred up the Gentiles. Now there were Gentiles who also came to believe, but they stirred up the Gentiles in the community who didn't believe. Yes. Now, also we find in here that where they were preaching, there was a temple to Zeus. Okay? Probably Hermes. And so that was competing religions. Right? And so there are some of the Gentiles who had been of the temple of Zeus, most likely, and who would take offense at this proclamation of a new religion. Okay? 
Um, so they stirred up uh, the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there speaking boldly to the Lord for the Lord, who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to do miraculous signs and wonders. Now the first question that I gave you is what was the purpose for the signs and wonders? It was to get the people's attention. Yeah. To get the people's attention? Okay. These, these, people, these people have special powers given to them by God. Okay. Yeah. okay. Convince them that they, they have the one and only true God. Okay, very good. Um, th it is important to also remember that there are people who may be religious, um, but the religious doesn't, their religion doesn't change. It doesn't grow, develop. It's just something that's they part of their lives. Follow the, the traditions and the rules and that's it. That's right. The ones who come to church on Christmas and Easter. Keister, uh, Christers, I guess. <laughs> and that doesn't mean that those don't believe. I'm not trying to draw judgment here. Right. I'm just trying to, to show you that the purpose of the signs and wonders is that then the gospel would stand out uh, amongst all these other people that had a diversity of beliefs it's and worshipped other gods. It's easy against the Gentiles, but what about the Greeks? Did they feel the same? They were the considered Greeks? Gentiles. So when you okay. say okay. Gentiles, they would also include the Greeks. Ah, okay. So okay. Gentiles are basically non-Jews. Yeah, right. Gentiles are basically non-Jews by birth. Oh, yeah. oh, okay. okay. Um, so the signs and wonders were done for a purpose. And that was to gain the attention and also show the superiority of the gospel or faith in Jesus over these other claims to uh, devotion. Okay? Now, though we are not told, what do you think divided the people? It says they're very important because we live in time full of division. And it says in verse 3, um, Enabling them to do miraculous signs, the people of the city were divided, verse 4. What were they divided over? What caused their division? Well, I think some of them felt that you could only do what the traditions were, and, and certain things, if you didn't obey that, then you weren't okay. of the church. I mean, you know... Mm -hmm. They were so over as the others. So what they were doing is that they they um, were defined by their traditions. This is just the way it is. Yeah. This is what we believe. I was raised this way. I was taught this. This is defines my life. And now you're preaching something. You're proclaiming something different. That is what they would use. What we, word we would use today is extreme. Well, you folks are extreme. Well, they were, they probably weren't convinced that what they were seeing was real. They might have feel, felt they were some sorcery. You know, some trickster was doing these things. That's true. They were planned that way. That's true. Um, so they were suspicious. They were not going to... And, and the power of our traditions some, sometimes overpowers our commitment to the truth. We're more interested in traditions than in Jesus. You know, they help define us. You know, uh, all of a sudden... Um, like someone shared not too long ago, that Christmas is, doesn't seem like Christmas for them now because their tradition has changed. It's still Christmas. Yeah, so what true. happens is we get drawn in by our traditions and rather than the truth. Oh, I'm the one who wants to break all the traditions. So I, I know, you're, you're, a, re you're a rebel. Right <laughs> yes, I know you. You were out there in the 60s burning your bra and proclaiming <laughs> <and> that. <laughs> At that age in the 60s, there wasn't much to put in. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can't edit that out, so well, you, you folks just going to have to do that for yourself. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I did march, though, but I, I marched um, for um, civil rights and civil rights yes. and that. You know, that's what I sure. marched for. Mm -hmm. and, how come, this right. next question is, how, why weren't the signs and wonders enough to convince them? Well, we don't have them today. Yeah. Well, we, we don't have them today. Well, we do. No, we, we do. Have, we don't have them the same way. Not the, in same, the same way. way. We do have 
miracles and things happen. Now Jesus, he for, performed signs and wonders. And even then, some people didn't believe. And some people wanted and demanded the signs and wonders if they were to believe. And so um, Jesus didn't give them necessarily what they wanted. Because what is wanted, what is needed, and what is desired is faith. Yeah. Not proof by signs and wonders. And, <coughs> and even though signs and wonders doesn't necessarily produce a genuine faith. We, we can be a little arrogant thinking, well, we didn't need Jesus with us to believe, so we believe about it. But we wouldn't, I don't think, if we didn't have his word here sure. to teach us. I mean, that's a wonder in itself. Right. But uh, I remind you of, of Hebrews chapter 11. Faith, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the essence of things unseen. Jesus saying to Thomas, blessed are you because you have seen, but blessed more are those who believe but have not seen. So we see that God's purpose was not to just give us signs and wonders. And there are people today that want to, and I'm, I'm a Pentecostal, and I'll admit that, a Pentecostal Methodist. I believe in the fullness of the Spirit and that God does wonders that I can't tell God how God's going to act. Okay, That's not my role. And, um, but yet I also, and Joe, you know, Joe, he's also came from a Pentecostal background. He also has struggles with that because there's abuses to that because there are people who only will have faith if they see the signs and mm. wonders. Mm. Okay. And, th and that's important, uh, to realize. So in the last question, uh, why do you think God limits the use of signs and wo wonders in our day? I say limits, because there's still are signs and wonders. This is, this is a different world. This is a different world that we're in now. And the signs and wonders that they saw back in those days, I mean, basically they felt that here are these people that God has put on earth to do these special wonders. The miracles we're getting now are people that are put on earth by God, but we don't necessarily recognize them as the people that are going to perform these wonders. The miracles just get performed. And I, and I think that uh, there are um, miracles that I've seen that have been performed, people that were to die and didn't die, people that were healed. Um, there are signs and wonders that are performed today, but they're not as prevalent because the danger of them being prevalent is that we depend upon them. And God looks at our life a little bit differently than what we look at it. We look at our life as this is what's important. This is it. You're born, you live your life, you die. And a lot of people, well, they like to say, I believe in heaven, but really, if you talk to them, they struggle with the idea of heaven. A lot of people right. do not believe. That's something I can't even remember it now. It's a problem in my memory. But in the daily bread today, talked about okay. some different things. <coughs> so that me now, but it was germane to this. Sure. So if you hear... Uh, someone or a movie comes out about a little girl that, you know, that some of those movies have come out mm -hmm. who miraculous things have happened uh, most people, okay, they can't explain them and we just won't ex try to explain them we can't explain them necessarily, but they're not enough to bring us to believe because we just can't believe in we still are stuck in tangible realities of our three dimensional world. In yes. 1999 I was given seven hours to live but God wasn't done with me yet yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, in 2000, wow. Peter was given five years to live. Well, we hope God is not. Yeah, it's 22 years. We hope that God has mm -hmm. hasn't uh, has more for you to do too, Bonnie, because you know we've had enough death lately. Yeah. We don't need yeah. any more. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but that's important because someone will ask if we're witnessing to our faith. Well, how come God doesn't do those wonders and miracles, you know, today? Mm -hmm. Well, why, if God is God and God has that power to do those things, then how come God just doesn't correct our world today? You see, because if God was to reveal his power in such a way, we would believe because we had to, not because we are invited out of relationship. He also gave us free will to make free our will. So I mean, it's important for us to realize that uh, God intensified 
and the amount of signs and wonders for a particular period because it was necessary to get attention, to form a community. And then as the signs and wonders decreased, they still maintained faith. You know, uh, and that's important. Even Jesus said to the crowds that came to him, um, you know, he responded to them and says, they demand a sign and wonder. He says, you folks are just following because you ate the bread and the fish. Okay? Not because you truly believe. And that's just a reality we have to, to live with. So they spent the time speaking boldly for the Lord, who confirmed their message by doing miraculous signs and wonders. We don't know what they were. Because, again, Luke does not want us to get distracted by the signs and wonders. Okay? We can become distracted by signs and wonders. And there's some people that will follow signs and wonders. Okay? Um, so the people of the city were divided. Always it's going to be, we're going to be divided. Some, because if you're a, an avid Christian, really devoted to your faith and practicing your faith, <coughs> they're going to think you're crazy. I know that Ron will tell a story, Ron Kelsch, because uh, he plays golf and, and um, mm -hmm. uh, he loves that game. And all of a sudden, he came to a point in his life, he says, well, they call him, they want to play on Sunday morning. He says, no, I'm not. I, I need to go to church. And they ridiculed him for that. <coughs> and... Um, you know, it's it's interesting. Um, so so that we have to make a choice. Um, so they were divided. Um, some sided with the Jews, others with the apostles. Um, again, when he's saying Jews, he's not talking about all the Jews. So some of the Jews believed and became disciples themselves. Okay? Uh, There's a plot among the Gentiles and Jews, those who didn't believe. Um together with their leaders to mistreat them and stone them, um, but they found it out. You know, someone uh, heard of it because they were Jews and Gentiles and intermixed with these people and friends, and so they warned them. And so they fled to Lystra and Derb and to the surrounding country where they continued to preach. So you haven't received one, one place, and so you move on. So now I want to look at the other question. Is some of these are, is Paul's speech to the crowd um, different from the previous sermon in the synagogue at Pisidian Antioch? And so he gives a, a preach. You know, he was called Hermes because I guess Hermes was the Greek uh, god that did more speaking. And Zeus was kind of silent and the boss there. Um, um, and so there was a man that was crippled, lame from birth. He listened as Paul was speaking, and Paul looked directly at him and saw that he had faith to be healed. Now, there's a faith that doesn't lead us to healing. And there's a faith that leads us to healing. Ooh. I'd like to know what that is. It just stop, makes me stop and wonder. I can't define that for you. But he saw that this man had faith enough to be healed. Maybe not faith enough to give his whole life to follow Jesus Christ. Uh, but faith enough to be healed. Believe that forces, supernatural forces, could do what could not be done. Okay? You know, why do you think, it's not one of the questions, even though he said, stand on your feet, and at that, the man jumped up and began to walk. Sounds similar to some other occasions, huh? So he had, he had enough faith to believe that his, that his feet would work. That's right. Mm -hmm. If they hadn't worked, then he hadn't never used them. Yeah. But he did jump up anyhow. Instead of falling on his face, he walked. Do you think then after his healing that his faith was um, completed? <laughs> that he wound up all of a sudden saying, hey, yeah. uh, this man represents Jesus, and Jesus is the one who healed me. So I'm now going to believe and follow Jesus. He may not have believed that. He may have just felt that something great happened to him. That it might not have been some imperial being that caused it to happen. Maybe he figured that his faith was great enough that he was able to accept it. So the reason why God will allow this man to be healed, well, I'll ask it a different way. So what would be the reason why God would allow this man to be healed? Because so many people knew what his condition was 
and God uses things, whether they're good or bad, to benefit us. Now, is this one of the signs and wonders, like were performed um, at the other city? It was it was a sign and wonder because it happened. Right. And other people, even if man wasn't completely convinced that it was his faith in Jesus or anything, other people that saw that would would interpret it a different way. Mm -hmm. They would say, you know, this is a miracle. You know, some some power has caused this to happen to this man because they knew him from birth. They knew that he was not just a fake sitting there and, you know, he hadn't been planted in the crowd to do this because they knew of him from long before these people were there. Okay. Um, you know, so they were able to do this miracle and so it got the attention, of course. But I think he also did it for this man. He had the faith enough to be healed not the faith enough to give his life. I, I, I would hope that by his healing, he would also say, yeah. I'm going to follow Jesus. Mm -hmm. Okay. But those are all things that we can't We know. don't know. <laughs> we don't know. But we do know, because of this sign and wonder, all of a sudden the crowd saw that Paul had done, they shouted, the gods have come down to us in human form. Well, God did come down to us in human form, right. in the form of Jesus, yeah. whose birth we celebrate. But they were distracted because of the sign of wonder to give credit to what they already believed. Okay? So uh, people will uh, find it difficult to believe. They have to explain what has been done. So signs and wonders can help us to question, but they do not lead us necessarily to making that choice of faith. Um, we have to choose to believe even that which we cannot believe. Because what happens if you're not healed? Okay. Um, we've prayed for people and they were healed. So what do we do with that? Um, no, he goes and gives us a, pre, a, a, a sermon. Um, and so uh, Paul heard this. They tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd. They tore their clothes. That is a Jewish sign of... of you no, know, they didn't have buttons like we have. I was going to say, why are they always tearing their clothes? That in the Old Testament is a sign of 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 grieving, oh. uh, and they're grieving over a lie. They they're grieving over the facts that that what they did for good was being misunderstood yeah. and being corrupted to support what is evil. So people can take what is good and turn it around and make it evil. And that's what they are tearing their clothes. It's, it's sorrow. And of course, when, that doesn't mean when they tore their clothes, doesn't mean they ripped the clothes and they didn't have any clothes on. Or it doesn't mean necessarily that they couldn't, you know, fasten them back up. They didn't have clothes like we have. Okay? Buttons and zippers and ripped those out. This is something different. Um, they were showing the intensity of their emotion and despair. They got, by doing so, they got the attention of those who were, who were speaking. And so he said, why are you doing this? We too are only men, human like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heaven and earth and the sea and everything in them. Okay. Now, so they're, they're diminishing themselves as the performers of miracles and lifting up God, who is the real source of that miraculous power. Right. These people that saw this miracle had, I mean, the only thing they had to relate it to, I mean, it was just kind of a, it was a lot of miracles. It's, okay, this guy you yep. know, healed them. And they have nothing to, except for their old pagan religion. Mm -hmm. That's all they had. So without, you know, more, you know, believing and more faith, I, mean, I can see where they would go. Yeah. I don't know. Now, what, what does this tell you about the personality and faith of Paul and Barnabas. They were humble. Humble. Mm -hmm. And wasn't Paul also the one who was willing to go out yeah, and try to save the anywhere. anywhere. Mm -hmm. And they go anywhere mm -hmm. with any crowd. So how would you define humility here? What constitutes humility? He didn't claim that it was his power that did it. Now, for many people, to all of a sudden be a source of, of something good, uh, we like to take credit for it. Yeah, I didn't do it. God did it, not me. Oh, 
And he grieved over that. Uh, most people would say, oh yeah, well, you know, God did it, but, you know, he used me, you know, as his channel. And so humility is magnifying God and recognizing our place. We're just men like you. We're just humans like you. Um, and so he went on and kind of attacked their faith. We want you to turn away from these worthless idols. Wow, that hurts. If that's what you've been following all your life, right? Mm -hmm. huh. You're tearing down everything that I define my life as? And, and um, these worthless things to the living God. The living God. So there is a God. It's not Zeus. It's not Hermes. you got to get rid of those things. They're idols. But it also says, in the past, in the past, God let all nations go their own way. So when we look at our world and the way it is, even today in the 21st century, is God allowed us to go our own way. Define our life upon what we, we see and experience. And we don't see God or easily experience God. So we take claim to what we can do, even though what we can do is really given to us by God. He gave us free will, but he hoped we'd make a better use of it. No, uh, that's true. <laughs> yeah. right. and, and so even though he, he let them go their own way, mm -hmm. um, he has not left himself without testimony. Now, we don't have Jesus doing miraculous signs among us, but we have the testimony. But we know Jesus is with us. We have both the testimony of God's word. We also have the testimony of the Holy Spirit. Right. You know, I struggled time with God's word. I heard it, didn't believe it. I thought it was kind of extreme. I'll take part of it and I'll, you know, toss aside the other that I don't find that ask me ask too much for me. I'll accept what is palatable to me. And it doesn't work that way. Uh, that's not what God wants. And so that's playing games with God. Until all of a sudden the Holy Spirit was dealing with me and my circumstance, my experiences. And then, you know, I was asked, what am I going to do about it? I had the testimony. Not only of the Word, I had the testimony of the Holy Spirit. Who finally convinced me. It wasn't any person that convinced me, but the Holy Spirit. A struggling within me convinced me. Um, he has shown kindness to, by giving you rain from heaven and the crops and the seasons and such and such. So, uh, so Jesus said uh, that God causes the sunshine and the rain to fall upon the just and the unjust alike. Jesus said that. But a lot of people have said, well, I deserve this. I deserve what I have. I think a lot of my life, you know, I deserve this. Hey, how about those people? They don't deserve it. They're not working for it. Or, you know, we don't take into account what circumstances or struggles they might have that we didn't have. So he's saying, you know, the good, you know, he's confirming what Jesus said in, in what's been in the Old Testament all along. God causes sunshine and rain to fall upon the just and the unjust. We determine whether we're going to be just and unjust. This world and life is limited because it's going to come to an end because that's how God can determine um, who is going to believe by faith and trust him? Just like Adam and Eve being told not, about, not to take that fruit. Just trust me. You don't need to know the reason why. Well, I got to know why. You know, as much as we try to know why, we'll get some answers, but we're never going to find the definitive answer now. We are called to trust by faith. Um, Moms or groups were pretty fickle. Oh yeah. Because they're they're gonna, you know, um, they believe they're gods. Then all of a sudden, the Jews come and change their minds for them. I mean, well, they're waiting they because really do a flip -flop. okay. The question is, why would they flip flop? Because they didn't really believe. They didn't they believe. Flip -flop. But also they had their tradition. This is the way I was, was raised. I believe in Zeus. I believed in Hermes. Mm -hmm. Now you're asking me to toss it all out. 
and follow this Jesus, you're redefining my whole existence. And all of a sudden, some others come and say, no, 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 it's by Zeus or Hermes. You know, Zeus and Hermes is testing you. Are you going to remain steadfast with Zeus and Hermes? Or are you going to betray the truth and accept these lies? No, I could think of all sorts of different arguments that they could use, okay? Um, but they won the crowd over, not everyone, but the majority of the crowd over. Um, so they dragged Paul him outside thinking uh, and stoned him. I wonder what happened to Barnabas. See, Barnabas was not the speaker, right? Paul was the speaker. He had the big mouth like me. And so they're, they're like, don't don't kill the message messenger. You know? But uh, so they took him out to stone him. This gives you a little bit of knowing about what Paul endured. You know, you only get stoned so many times it doesn't kill you, and it's going to have some effect on your on your physical health. And later on in Second Corinthians, he talks about his thorn in the flesh. Think about being stoned and hit with rocks, in your head. You might cover yourself as best you can. But just think of what that effect has on your body if you survive it. Well, didn't Paul always have problems with his vision? It comes yeah. out later in, later in his letters. He says, see, I write this with my big, large, my large print with my hands. Yes. And he had a lot of people write for him because he had problems doing it. They're called amanuenses. And there are people that some would, would hire an amanuensis, secretary. Others would knew Paul and they became a believer and they said, I'll write for you. Okay, um, so that's very true. Um, so, thinking he is dead, but after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city. The next day, he and Barnabas left for Durham. You know, why didn't they? Why didn't they gather around him as he was being stoned? Before he, before he was stoned. Yeah. Did the, he want them to think he was dead? He might have played dead as he's being hit in order to preserve his life and. And maybe some people were still throwing some stones and the other disciples gathered around him. Yeah. Or else they gathered around him to be able to try to pull him aside and start bandaging him, healing him, whatever. <coughs> so whatever, they gave their witness and testimony, time to leave. So you go to Derb. Um, so now we come to 21. Before I leave that, I want to go back to the questions I wrote. Uh, Oh, well, we're not quite there. But how is Paul's speech to the crowd different from his previous sermon to the synagogue in Pisidian Antioch? Well, he didn't get stoned. Didn't get stoned. <laughs> because what he was doing, he was attacking uh, their tradition, yeah, their beliefs, and where the other one, they already believed in God, and so Christianity uh, was a... Um, the refinement of what they believed. So his, his approach had to be different. His approach had to be different because the circumstance warranted it. So the circumstance will warrant how we present a message. Yeah. Like you coming into a church, you know, or a crowd that you know yep. believes versus you're going into, say, down in where nobody ever believed anything. And Definitely going to approach a little different. Yes. So it's probably an entirely different crowd. Entirely yeah. different crowd. Yeah. No, I'm, yeah. I, 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 if I went to a church, I'm going to preach one way. Yeah. If, I, if I go to the American Legion, oh. they have to give a speech. Uh -huh. okay? yeah. I'm going to, uh, there's going to be some believers there, but I'm going to find a form what I say to fit the crowd uh -huh. and the need. Okay? Uh -huh. All right. That's good. Now we go to return to Antioch and Syria. Well, that was a nice place. They received me well. I've been beat up enough. I think I want to go to some safety. Um, so they preached the good news in the, that city and won a large number of disciples. <coughs> then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. So they went backwards from where they had already gone. Okay? Strengthening the disciples, encouraging them to remain true to the faith. So in other words, <laughs> it's fine that these people came to faith. They have to reinforce it. They have to reinforce it. See, faith always has to be reinforced. If someone comes to faith, they can lose faith. Circumstances, uh, other people talking to them, 
can persuade him, oh, that's too extreme. You're going to be one of those extreme people, you know. No one wants, and everyone wants to be accepted. Um, so they need to strengthen them. And by strengthening them, they need to gather together in their own faith communities to be able to strengthen one another. But sometimes Satan gets in there, boy, and he gets a hold of you, and you better really watch out. He wants to rob you from your faith. Absolutely. Use whatever means you can to do so. Okay? Um, we must go through many hardships, so they said, to enter the kingdom of God. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. No, tell that to someone you're encouraged to go through to, to come to faith. Yeah, come to faith, but that's going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be harder yet. Because while life is going to be hard, it has its hardships, right? Mm -hmm. You add faith on it, and people are going to say, yeah, well, why did God allow this? Yeah. Why did God allow that? What, you know, what about this and what about that? They're going to, you know, it pressures you. And, and you're going to ask yourself, because sometimes yeah. I'll ask, well, why, why, Lord? Okay, why? They look for quick solutions, and sometimes there isn't a quick solution to Whatever the issue is. And faith is not necessarily something we choose just to be relieved in this life. Mm -hmm. Which means you have to believe in something more. Mm -hmm. Things you cannot see. Mm -hmm. That's also found in Hebrews 11. A whole list of saints in the Old Testament. They didn't mm -hmm. receive what was promised, but they believed. And that's an important thing. So that's, a, that's one that could be actually underlined and it would be a good one. Uh, and, the, and those churches, uh, Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church. See, it's called church then, mm -hmm. the synagogue. <laughs> and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. <coughs> so in other words, they went back to where they had preached to organize churches. You can't expect we're going to come back through here every time you need a kick in the pants or, you know, inoculation or a boost. You've got to form a community of believers to encourage one another. You need to have a sanctuary. You need to have a safe place where you can go. You need to have that. And so without structure, uh, faith is more greatly assaulted. Until that structure also gets assaulted and uh, kind of uh, moves in the wrong direction, as it did in the Corinth church. That's what those letters are about. But anyway, so we see that that's what they did. After going through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia. And when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. You can look on a map and find those places. It's good to do so. You just Each Bible most oftentimes has a map of the journeys of Paul. And you'll be able to see the directions that they went. But they went about 110 miles. <coughs> no, more than that. Is it 1,010? Yeah, 1,100 miles, I think it was. Um, that's quite a distance. From Italia, they sailed back to Antioch. They didn't go across the sea. So they traveled quite a distance. I think it's 1,100 miles. Um, where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. So they were sent by the church in Antioch. And they were returning after finishing their mission. Right? On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples, probably healing, probably getting re-encouraged themselves, uh, those things. Okay? So any questions we, um, regarding that? I'm trying to see the verse where all of a sudden John left them. But we'll look at uh, chapter 15. Some men came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the brothers. So they came from Judea, so they were more Jewish believers. Okay? Um, Unless you are circumcised according to the customs taught by Moses... You cannot be saved. So they were trying to discourage their faith by adding things onto their faith that was not essential. Okay. I want to clarify that there are things that are essential. 
there are things that are not essential. And so John Wesley and others, reformers, have said, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. And in all things, charity. But there's a distinction between that which is essential and that which is not essential. You know, uh, Sharon and I were talking as we were making lunches for the homeless down there. We were talking about clothing. And I remember as a, a boy going to church, my grandpa took me and got me a first suit, got me my second suit. You know, he'd hold my hand. We didn't talk much. He was not a talker. Uh, maybe I didn't give him time as a, as a grandson. Uh, uh, you know, I just remember him holding my hand and taking me for ice cream. And, you know, where are we going, grandpa? Going to get a suit. Why do I need a suit? You need a suit. <laughs> um, he wouldn't say much. Yeah, it's just the way it is, you know. Okay, grandpa. And, you know, I enjoyed, and I was raised, going to church rather formal. And it made me feel like I really was in church if I was dressed more formal. Well, those things have slid away. Um, and I've allowed myself to be able to, to come to church, not necessarily Bible studies, but on Sunday mornings without necessarily wearing a suit. But I have to admit, and I confess to, to Sharon, that sometimes I enjoy dressing up because it makes me feel what I'm doing is special. What I mean? But is it more special to God? Is it essential or non essential? Non essential. Non essential. But you know, I have to laugh. Peter told us, oh, I never had a suit. Ah, uh, I never had a suit. But we were, his son wanted a new suit or something, and he was giving us a hard time. And so I looked through the pictures, and there he is in a suit. Hmm? And I said, well, who's this young man in a suit? He said, that was his confirmation picture. So he was 12, 13. And he said, and I said, uh, you've never had a suit? He said, well, yeah, there's a man who used to come and take my father and myself and my brother into New York City, and we had suits made for us, and they did that two times a year. Yeah. So this the poor child who never had a suit yeah. had been made for him twice a year. <laughs> Um, some other, just to think about what is essential and what is non-essential. Uh, there are churches that I've served in which um, um, they dressed up in suits, and black was the fair. I was, one time was hired out of Houghton College uh, by the Free Methodist Church, and I served in Elkland, Pennsylvania. And uh, Pastor Harry Dow, my senior pastor, was also in charge. He took, voluntarily took over the courting church. And we tried to revise the Corning Church. And Harry Dow had red hair and he had a red beard. <laughs> and it was the belief of that church, that real fundamental conservative church in Corning, that you did weren't to have a beard. Men were to be shaved. You didn't have a beard. Now it need to be trimmed nice. Okay. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, and so here he was, he went to that church and he had a beard. Did he stir pot, you know? We stirred the pot and other things as well, trying to awaken that church spiritually to the real gospel and to do things instead of their traditions that they were taught and accepted because people weren't going to come to that church, the restrictions. Okay. Um, unfortunately, we were not successful. We grew the Upland Church, but we weren't successful in courting, and eventually we sold the church to a Maranatha. I don't know if you've ever heard of Maranatha. Kind of a Maranatha. Uh, congregation. Mm. Well, they didn't want to change, they died. Uh, you know, they had dress codes, behavior codes, how you're going to do these things were defined how they were. And that's less so now, but there's still that, okay, in many different churches. Well, I must say I object when you see really, really short dresses that are, I think they're inappropriate. Or they come in a, a ripped old t-shirt and cut off jeans. You know, shorts, short shorts. I can agree with you. I, I just don't think, I mean, you're coming in God's house. That's mm -hmm. how I look at it. You know, if you go to visit someone, you're not going to go like that usually. You'll dress up a little if someone invites you to their home. That's how I So, So the real about. rule is what is decent. Yeah. Okay. Um, because if we also had some about suits and things like that or certain apparel, 
some people cannot afford that. No. That, so you, you come to bring the problem. best that you have. But, but you don't and I particularly understand about the girls' with skirt, shirt, skirts, because yeah. I know you're talking about a certain church we were both at, yeah. and these beautiful young ladies got up on the podium, and they had, yeah, yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. Uh, worse, if they, if they were down on the, the floor, that was pretty good, but uh, um, coming, going up the steps to sing, uh, you know, it just was not yeah. fitting. Yeah. I don't think it's, it's just not correct. No class, that's how I feel about it. So there's some other, what are some other things that maybe divide people? Uh, how about alcohol? Okay. Some Christians believe you can drink alcohol. They don't agree with drunkenness, but they can drink alcohol. And other Christians say, no, you can never have alcohol. No, no, I Show how Methodist Church has changed. We were, the for, we were the forefront of the temperance movement. United Methodist women were a force to contend with. Okay. And uh, <laughs> you can still be a force to contend with, but not quite in the same way. Okay? Um, but that, you know, can you be a Christian drink or not? How about baptism? I'm sorry, on the cruise, it was a little old ladies that were guzzling down the drinks, let me tell you. <laughs> there's, there's, there's also then, um, uh, how about communion? How you take communion? Um, how, how, you know, all sorts of different things. Um, how to do the, how to say the Lord's Prayer. I got chastised one time because I did the Lord's Prayer and changed it from forgive us our debts to sins. And I had to show them, well, it says that in some of the different places in the scriptures. And it means uh, uh, in trespasses. And I said, that, you know, and there's a reason for those. They have distinctive meanings between Sins, trespasses, and debts. Okay, and that, which I'm not going to go into here. And though they're important, so it's important for us to say all three types, so that we can understand the nuance of what they are, because they're in Scripture. They said, no, 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 only this one. <laughs> Why? That's the one I've said and was taught to say all my life. Okay. There's no move from the mountain, okay? Yeah. But, you know, that can divide people. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I've been in churches where there's no dancing. Yeah, Could not dance. I'm just going yeah, I'm zero going here. I like my wine and I'm taking yeah, a dance yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I, when I was in Tyrone, outside of Courting, New York, a wonderful congregation, I've gone back there before to do services for people mm -hmm. that I knew and pastored. And... Uh, one of the things we did is that all of a sudden, during the wintertime, it wasn't so much during the summer, but when late fall hit and all through wintertime, once a month, the church, we had probably 60 people. We'd go to the Dresden Inn. <laughs> they had a certain band, and she arranged to make sure that band that we liked that played a variety of music that <laughs> we enjoyed. And we had, you know, um, 30 couples go. She loved it. The manager, because we filled the inn. <laughs> we we ate and we danced. We used okay. to go score dancing. Mm -hmm. yep. And of course, most of the time you dance in churches and places and there's no alcohol. Yeah. But when you go to a campground, the floor you go in the, the hall to dance. Everybody's together <laughs> and you have a few cocktails. Now, some things that also divide is baptism. You baptize an infant. Can you yeah. baptize an adult? And how you baptize? Can you have it poured over your head like I did with Jake? Can you, do you have to be totally immersed? Do you, you know, all these things become rules of human beings and traditions that can get in the way. So there is essentials and there's non-essentials. There are some churches that don't have any musical instruments. That's right. And they, don't so, they do so because they come from a certain tradition in which they're trying to avoid the pride. They found that musicians will have a great deal of pride. And I've run into that. Sylvia and I struggled with that. She never had that problem. But we did run into some, and I've run into some churches mm -hmm. in which there were musicians who were there more because of, well, they enjoyed their bow. Mm -hmm. They enjoyed the performance of a choir that was magnificent. Yes, magnificent. But is the glory going to God or is the glory going to them? Yeah, so I some churches understand. chose not to have music at all. I don't go that far. I couldn't understand why you had to have a, a well, professional paid person come in for it to teach your choir. 
Well, they because kind of thing. the reason why is because if you had a professional sounding choir, you gain people who want to, to also, they're attracted by that. But are they attracted to faith? Are they attracted to That's Jesus? That's what you go to church for, I'm sorry. Okay. So I'm just trying to bring up some, the differences between essentials, non-essentials and stuff. Uh, some churches, you couldn't, oh man, we played cards downstairs. Mm -hmm. Not today. Mm -hmm. Some churches, no, you don't do that. Yeah. And you have face cards? Oh, that's worshiping kings and queens. And Okay. Uh, hey, I'm just saying what I've experienced in my in my years. I think you just have to do moderation in all things. <laughs> Except one, and you and I will talk about that. I think we have to be non -judge, not as judgmental. Too. Mm -hmm. I agree. There's been judgment of, between churches of different names. And Charlie used to talk about that a lot. He try to go to different churches to try to see what they're doing, try to do cooperation, and uh, it's hard. Yeah. And particularly more when there's fewer people that are religious, religiously oriented, they then, you know, you're in competition. You feel like you're in competition with another church. Yeah. When some of us came over here to Cookville, it was like, you're still in the way. Well, <laughs> as much as yeah, it seemed like it seemed, it seemed like as much as you were trying to do things together, there was always the powers that were trying to pull you apart, and then they started pulling off the names or, or changing the names because the name brought about certain attitudes or certain ways of thinking in that location. So let's get back into this because this whole chapter 15 is going to be talking about that. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so unless you are circumcised, these Ju Judean uh, Christians, According to the customs of Moses, you cannot be saved. So, you know, you take our customs and you can add Jesus. Okay? And this, this brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So in the church, oh, hey, can, there can be dispute and debate. <laughs> Isn't that novel? See, that never happens in our understanding, is it? <laughs> in our experience. Um, so Paul and Barnabas were appointed along with some other believers, to go to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. Okay, we got to settle this. So they recognized these elders from Jerusalem, from where the church was born, so they went back to hold a council. Well, did, did God ever set up this type of council that you're supposed to decide? Um, no, but he did say to Peter, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. What you open shall be open. What you close will be closed. So he gave us authority to make some of these decisions over some non-essential matters. I'm, I'm, I'm referencing that as non-essential matters. Non-essential matters. Non-essential matters. There are essential matters that should never be a debate no matter who you call yourself as a Christian. Okay? And some would take contention with what I just said. <laughs> um uh, so the church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made it to the brothers very made the, all the brothers very glad, and they came to Jerusalem. They were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders, to whom they reported everything God had done through them. So they're hey, we're growing. Hey, we rejoice in this. Ha ha ha! This is Paul and Barnabas, and they're the ones that do it because we're stuck in Jerusalem doing our thing. Okay. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood and up and said, Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses. So there are Pharisees who are elders in the Jewish faith who wanted the continuation of what they had been taught and ingrained in them. Seeing by faith challenges, true faith challenges are presuppositions. Helps us to dig into the truth. Um, the apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. So now it's Peter. Yep. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. Remember, where is that at? A few chapters back. What was the guy's name? House where he went to speak to the Gentiles. Cornelius, who was a centurion. He was worse than that, he was a Roman. Oh my gosh. You know? And they accepted them. Peter came back and said, hey, the Holy Spirit 
was in them as much as on us. So, hey, how, who are we to judge and determine that they are not believers? Okay? God who knows the heart showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them. Okay? Just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Oh, that's the core truth. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear? The yoke of all these tedious laws. And they always failed. They wrote exceptions. They, wrote, they added laws unto laws so they can get beyond the truth. Okay? Verse 11. No, we believe it is through grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved. Just as they are. The whole assembly became silent. <laughs> uh, Holy Spirit shuts our mouths. Um, as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the miraculous signs and wonders. There's another purpose for the miraculous signs and wonders. For God's people. God had done among, among the Gentiles through them. When they finished, James spoke up. Remember there's a James that got killed. Mm -hmm. Um, that was the, the brother of John. This, this is the James the Lord's James, brother. Is this phrase, James the brother of Jesus? Yes, I believe so. Uh, brothers, listen to me. Simon has described to you, uh, to, to us, how God first showed his concern by taking from the Gentiles a people for himself. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this, as it is written. After this, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild, and I will restore it that the remnant of men may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things that have been known for ages. So he's even saying that the evidence of the Old Testament points to the revelation coming through the Jews and opening up the way for the Gentiles. Now look what he's doing to prove his point. The word. That's how we decide what's going to be true is by the preponderance. Let me see. I'm going to use that word again. Preponderance of the evidence of God's word. There's some things in my life that I still will bother me that I've come to believe because I've abandoned my trust to God. Okay? That I struggle with, have struggled with. And I have no other choice because of the preponderance of the word. And that helps to define for me what is essential. And even when I don't agree, I'm not prone to degree, degree, agree, I must surrender to trust God's word. I can try to examine the word. I can try to question it. I can try to, to reinterpret as much as I can. But when... I'm, I get to twisting it, to picking and choosing what I will believe from the word, but, and then neglect the other things in the word. I'm not being true to myself or true to God. I may never know some of the answers to my questions in this life, but I will know. That's why John Wesley and others, they said, in essentials, unity. Non-essentials, liberty. But in all things, charity. I may not dis I may disagree with someone who has a certain point or idea, political opinion or whatever, and I'd be able to substantiate my opinion as much as I can to the word, but if they also confirming through the word for themselves, they I may consider them misinformed. But at the same time, I need to show liber I got need to show charity. I'll love them. I'll treat them with worth and dignity even though I disagree with them. Well, not all people are going to agree. That's right. It's just part of life. So yeah, it's been part of our history. Yes, it's true. Sometimes I think these are very important chapters because this is talking about, you know, the formation of the church. They're forming elders and forming churches. And now they're trying to find them what are our, our core beliefs. Okay? Uh, it is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. 
Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from meat of strangled animals, and, and from blood. For Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. Now, so he's suggesting um, that there are some restrictions. That doesn't mean you have to be circumcised. You don't have to go through these ritual things. But let's take a look at some of the things that he does ask. All right. Uh, they should abstain from food polluted by idols. Why? I don't understand that. Uh, how do idols pollute food? I mean, well, things that somebody's offer is an offering to an idol. Yes. Okay. Then you don't eat that food. You don't right. It's an offering. Okay. All right. Because because for some who had uh, and Paul will talk about this in Corinthians, and um, in Romans. And uh, he says, everything is clean. Okay? But I control what I do so I will not cause a stumbling block for someone else. Okay? So uh, if I go to someone's house and I believe it's okay to have alcohol and they don't believe it's not good to have alcohol, I'll have a Coke. I don't have to have alcohol. Right. right. You know, because even though I may feel they're wrong, I don't need to needlessly offend them. I can talk to them about the issue. I can look at the scriptures with them. But in the end, if they hold to their belief, I'm, it's not my place. They've got to stand, as Paul would say, before God, as I have to stand before God. Um, and so uh, for some of these Jews who became Christians, the idols were something to stay away from. And there's idols today that we need to stay away from. You know, We may like a certain football team or a basketball team, Hallelujah, that's okay. But when I see how some people, all of a sudden, I was watching, we were bowling the other day, and there's this guy that had the sports channel on. I couldn't hear it. I didn't need to hear it. And he's actually bawling. He's crying, wiping tears away from his eye. Give me a break. There are kids who are dying. There are people who are shivering in the cold, and you're worried about, oh, this guy because of this unfair thing, and you wipe the tears from his eyes. Is that an idol? I got in a discussion with somebody recently about the amount of money that these oh, yeah. oh, men yeah. are paid yes. for catching a ball flying through the air or tossing it into a basket. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking there's surgeons out there that are saving lives, and they're not getting paid that amount of money. This person said, well, they put that other money out into the community. I said, no, nope, they're getting paid too much. I'm standing my ground. You know, one of them's getting like $1.6 million mm -hmm. right, for playing basketball. Well, they get paid more than that. Oh, I know. Yeah. <laughs> this, this was just the one that was on yes, the other yes. night. And I'm like, yes. you've got to be kidding me. Nobody's worth that one. No. no. What I get crazy for all the, the artifacts and the artwork and the different things in the Vatican, mm -hmm. they could feed the world if they put that in a museum or sold it. True. Nobody gets to see it but a bunch of old men. There's, there's, a, <coughs> there's, a, there's a place for, for you can, rooting for a team or uh, working hard for wealth or uh, for a better life and those things. There's a proper place for that. But when it defines you and you actually begin to chase after it because it's your goal, mm -hmm. then that becomes your God, yeah, right. mm -hmm. your idol. Yeah, right. And it can happen in so many different ways. And that's interesting. This, the, the new book, he doesn't live in the Vatican. Yes. He lives on his own apartment. Yep. Yep. He doesn't want to be surrounded by all that wealth and all that That's true. Stuff. I give them credit. I give them credit. So the food offered to idols is not that, as Paul would say in, in 1 Corinthians or you know in Romans, that, that there's nothing to it. At the same time, um, you are don't want to offend a person's weaker faith. Okay? And so we have the freedom to choose not to practice certain things, not to offend someone else. Okay? And we have to be careful about... Uh, um, because what happens is by eating food polluted by idols, we're giving the idols credence. We're saying yes. Um, so, and then from sexual immorality. So many of these other faiths 
allowed great freedom sexually and even had temple prostitutes and other things. You know, sexuality has always been a problem for human beings. Okay? That's just what it is. And God has a particular defined um, morality for human relationships and the use of human sexuality. I'm not going to go into that. Um, but that's important. So they're coming from these this culture in which that was okay. Now they're coming into a culture where we're saying, you're making that an idol. You're making your own sexual desire your God that you want to chase after. And you can't do that. Okay? You either are, are, are gods or not, or Jesus or you're not. It's one reason why the chastity in the Roman Catholic Church, um, the rule of chastity, was there. You're married to Christ. It means you're giving up those human temptations that seem normal to other people. I'm not sure that's correct. Um, I'm no, certainly I'm glad. Sure I'm certainly glad I didn't marry a nun. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, my, uh, which is interesting, my aunt who just died, I announced that on Sunday. She was 99. Uh, her two sisters were nuns. She outlived them. And she was going to become a nun, but then she loved dance. Can't be a nun and dance. So she went and studied ballet. And then, and then also she wound up meeting my uncle, and that did it. There was none for her. <laughs> she never had any children. She wasn't able to. But, uh, well, not in the way she wanted to dance, okay? So, that, all right. Um, professional ballet and stuff like that. Um, but anyway, so then how about meat from strangled animals? Yeah, I don't quite get that. Well, their blood hasn't been let out of them, so the blood's still within the body. In other words, yeah. if, it's, if, they're not, if their throat's flushed, then they hang them up and let the blood drain out. If Jean Mumford was here amongst us, bless her heart, oh, she's gone, she would have loved my talking about this. Right. Yeah. Because she loved animals. Yeah. She hated when we studied the Old Testament about all that, those poor animals. Okay. I said, well, what about the people? Oh, it's okay. I have the animals I was concerned about. <laughs> <laughs> but the, her job was to catch the blood when they butchered yeah. the animals. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's gross. And she said, that was my job. It was your job. But you see what happens when uh, it, it speaks of animal cruelty. So even though we are given permission to eat meat, to use all that God has given us in creation, we still are to treat animals in a certain way. In a Jewish tradition and under the law, they would respect the life even of an animal. And so to strangle it is to cause a slow, painful death. Right. And so when they butchered, whether it's for a sacrifice or for meat, it was quick. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? And, and that's the point. So he's saying, you know, this, this is our tradition, but there's a reality in that because God has given us the, these animals, but we're to treat them with kindness, not cruelty. Oh, the Indians mm -hmm. I suppose all them. I mean, the first thing they do after they kill an animal is thank God for it. Yes. For yes. They're giving their life. Yes. That ant, thank that animal for giving their mm -hmm. life. And I want, I want you to realize that that wasn't just their tradition. That was the Jewish tradition, too. Okay, when they sacrificed an animal, they, they prayed, and they prayed also the prayers. Um, I used to remember some of them. was thanking God for the life. And the fact that this life, I deserve that death. But this animal is taking the place for me. It wasn't an offering to please God that way. It was an offering to me, reminding me when I make give that animal that is meaningful to me, it, it should be me. Okay? Uh, so motivation is very important behind anything. And then from blood. Life is in the blood. That was the Jewish tradition. So we try not... Now, I have a problem with this. I've had some discussions with some people that like their meat raw. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> You know, Peter, what did you eat? Yeah. The Scottish, what did they eat? Oh. Blood pudding. Yeah. Black pudding. Black pudding. Mm -hmm. It's oats and ox blood. Yeah, blood. Yep. And you used to fry it up and say, oh, this is so good. So, so gross. These were concessions, moral concessions. I wanted to see these are more moral than ceremonial. Mm -hmm. The ceremonial, the circumcision they were giving up. Mm -hmm. Okay. But the moral considerations were what was important. Okay? 
Uh, we've gone after two, so I don't want to go any further. So we're going to pick up there at verse 22. Before we do that, I want to make sure. Well, there's some questions that I'd ask you. We'll continue on with these. But um, how do people you know interpret the gospel by their own prejudices and beliefs? What are they? What was one of the biggest misunderstandings about following Christ you had to overcome before you could believe? That's a, a question number five. Okay. And one of my misunderstandings you know, was around human sexuality. I'll confess that. Uh, number six, in the church circles you grew up in, what were some of the extra biblical rules imposed upon you? or what cultural manners or morals were expected of you. When you first became an active Christian, what behavioral norms were expected of you? So in other words, to sort through what things were expected of you that maybe had nothing to do with your relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Okay? Uh, I want you to think about those. And I want us to have some serious conversation about those the next time we come together. Okay? Mm -hmm. And you can go down number eight. It's interesting because um, <coughs> Peter's struggle, uh, even though he stood up and defended the Gentiles, right, in his sermon there, uh, he also had a problem. He wavered himself. And you can re read that in Galatians 2, 15 and 16, uh, surrounding the, those verses. I'd have you to read that, please. Um, to let you know that even we as dedicated Christians can waver in our understanding what really God wants and what we really um, are just what we want. Okay, how about if we have some prayer. Gracious God, before we meet again, we'll be celebrating Christmas. Whether well, Christmas fell on the December 25th, which is doubtful, or whether it's September, or even as some believes, that was during, Pen uh, during, during Passover in the spring. It really doesn't matter. We celebrate the fact that you have been born into our lives, and being born into our lives, you've given us hope. You've given us hope through give, showing, revealing your love, and you provide us with an inward, deep experience of peace and an abiding joy that nothing in this world can give to us particularly as we think of those who have left us physically in this life. The joy that we have knowing that they're not, they're not gone. Their life has not ended. But there is life. Oh, you've given us such joy and hope. Lord, we just pray that you help us. Whether we have a busy family celebrations or quiet ones alone, we pray that you well, let yourself be known to us in a new and real way until we meet again. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, it's Friday. Well, it's Friday. I was going to say Friday morning, maybe. I mean, it's obvious.